Okay, hi everyone. Thanks for coming. Um, our presentation is uh, about the Gipster Beyond CRUD. My name is Paul Guaglia. I'm a senior project manager and a software architect. And with me, there is Enrico that will conduct the tool, and it is a senior software developer. We work for Intesis. Intesis is uh, an Italian company. Uh, we are based on Verona, if you know it, uh, where it is. We are a 100 employees company, and uh, we work uh, for enterprise industry, mainly banks, insurance companies, manufacturing. Uh, we have a development pattern that is uh, designed to deliver, we name it. That means we put a strong emphasis, a strong stress on the design phase of our project. That means that we have a, a, a user experience development team and a, a, de a design team. This strong emphasis uh, forces us to build a high interactive application and we choose uh, uh, single page application as uh, mainly React but also Angular uh, as our web application and a mobile native application for mobile part. We choose JHipster as uh, our develop uh, our uh, backend to develop API and microservices. Microservices. Okay, we started JHipster in 2017. We, for, with Intesis, we are the third Gypsy bronze, bronze sponsor. We have almost 10 developers, on average, uh, that are working with Gypsy nowadays. We have already done five projects running in production, and we have three big projects in development phase. One of these is a uh, non-banking, a non-banking application for one big, big bank, uh, European bank. We have done some stuff uh, for the community. We have uh, modules and blueprints. We have just uh, published two modules. And we have done some contribution uh, of the community. So I'll give the floor to Enrico. OK, thank you. So hello, everybody. Thank you again to the JPster team for giving us the possibility to talk. Uh, I'm going to start telling you how we started with JPster. The first project was not an enterprise project. Actually, it was a project for a wine reseller in Verona. Uh, <laughs> uh, Verona is quite famous for his wine. Um, uh, what the customer wanted uh, was a mobile application uh, needed by the, the sales people to go around and see the pro show the products, uh, show the catalogs. And so we basically prepared two, uh, we developed uh, uh, two mobile apps, two native mobile apps, both Android and iOS, and the backend was made with JPster. The backend APIs uh, uh, used, we, were, we used them both for the back office, so that the back office people could insert products, documents, images, and scale them and stuff. And then uh, with some open API endpoints and authentication, default, default authentication of JPster. Um, we connected them to the app. Um, it was a small project, simple app, few entities, a uh, few roles, uh, some additional API first endpoint. We had a lot of fun. We were able to deliver it very, very fast. So we decided to go further and explore JHipster something with, for something more complex. This is where we are now. This is one of our uh, three big projects. Um, in addition to mobile development and uh, front-end, JIPS, their front-end development, we are also developing a React application built from scratch, uh, which is the main point we are selling to the customers. So we are not building this up with JIPster. Still with JIPster, we are using it as a back office and highly customizing entities to, um, to allow back office user to um, configure all the product. And the React application is the one used by uh, the final by by the end users, um, it is it's highly interactive. Uh, it has dynamic forms uh, and a lot of stuff you have to con to configure. There's distributed cache, uh, many native queries. There are seven different roles and many teams involved. Uh, we didn't only uh, act as a server, but also as a client to an IIS server uh, developed by our customer. So we are not only providing API, but we are also consuming them. And uh, these 120 entities, which is uh, 
quite a lot. We split them in two JDL files, so that uh, we are thinking about splitting this huge monolith, this big monolith, to uh, a monolith, monolith and a microservice. So we are thinking and figuring out how to do. We are still not in production. Uh, we are trying it, and we will see. So what we want to build is API-driven enterprise. We are basically uh, helping customers to understand how uh, designing API first uh, is a real added value. This is the full picture. As I said, we didn't only connect the hipster as a server. We didn't only write server API, we also consumed them. And we connected the hipster with legacy databases, LifeRay application, both for content management system and for uh, delegating authentication to LifeRay and also consuming web services uh, above AES400, SAP, and some uh, ASB like Tipco and other API gateways. So I'm talking about why we choose uh, the title, Why Beyond Crude? There are many questions that raised in our team, like uh, is crude enough? How, how can I handle many entities and the open API endpoints? So I will compare code first and API first JAPSTER, how they can uh, live together, let's say. I will demo uh, some modules we have written and uh, uh, sub-module in the Zipster main generator is under development. And I will tell you how easy it is to integrate test containers with Zipster. Okay. So why beyond crude? This is uh, this is you, you, you all, Zipster developers, and you decide to create your monolith, uh, just as an example. So the first thing you do is running generator the hipster and you get the full stack, the Angular application, uh, all the controllers, uh, the user resource, the account resource. Soon after you have generated your application, what do you do? You pick up your JDL and you generate entities. So you have your entity st stack, let's say. It's you're starting building crude with entities. So you will, uh, soon you will understand it's not enough. And so we have learned it from a presentation last year. We start uh, extending entities, uh, and I strongly suggest you to go to the videos of the Jipster Conf last year, and there's a very nice presentation by Antonio, who explains this, how to do this. Then you start extending also default Jipster controllers, and then uh, create custom controllers, because crude is not enough, you start creating custom controllers, but because maybe your DTOs uh, design uh, thinking about the database, uh, in reality are not enough and uh, you have to customize even more. So you create custom controllers and soon enough external developers pop out. The first one is developing an Android application and it's going to ask you, I need some details, I need another API, I need another DTO. So you, what do you do? You create another controller and then the React developer wants the same. And not only external developers, also the hipster developers want to interact with your application, with your API. And you want, basically, uh, in this bunch of lines you see here, what you want is asking yourself, how do I make life easy for API consumers? Uh, we need uh, uh, interoperability. We need all the ecosystem to be productive. Everybody must be productive. You have to think about user experience when you design the APIs, not only how the database is structured. And you have to think about developer experience, not only the hipster developer experience, but also the, uh, for the, the developers who interact with your application. So uh, the hipster uh, already helps you with this. Um, how many of you are using this in production or in, in development? How many of you are familiar with this? Good. OK, one loses so much time in describing this. Uh, Springfox is a Java library that scans all the controllers. It exposes a Swagger 2 specification to a well-known endpoint. And thanks to Swagger UI 2, you're able to uh, see how your APIs are done, try them. And this is already an amazing tool uh, for developers. But we can do better. We can do some customization. And the first customization we, all, we often do, especially when there are external developers involved, is splitting this huge JSON file uh, in many JSON files, in such a way that you can group them by context, uh, you can decide that which APIs to show, even there's already an option to filter out some endpoints you don't want to expose to Swagger. You can customize it even more and expose different endpoints, uh, and you help developers to find what they need 
uh, or expose some APIs or not. This is some, just an example of how you can split uh, the groups. Uh, usually what we do is uh, isolating the authentication API because uh, we don't always rewrite them. So yeah, we isolate them so that also mobile developers, um, single page application developers can, uh, can use them. Another thing you can do, okay, this is how you can uh, group the, uh, the specification. Uh, this is just an example. I will link a GitHub repo at the end of the presentation with all these examples. And this is basically creating the authentication group uh, using regex for uh, the endpoints you need. Uh, but with this solution, you have to wait for the endpoint to be av available. Uh, so you have to run your as a hipster application, copy and paste the specification, uh, and you need the, the endpoint to be live for other developers to download them. So what you can do is uh, export them to JSON files. And uh, this is something we recently discovered thanks to the JIPster GitHub forum. Uh, and we, are, we have really started to do this. And to export these JSONs uh, generated by Swagger, you have to uh, run uh, an integration test. You simply iterate over the groups and uh, instead of serving the, the specification via controllers, uh, you just write them on the, your file system, and then, like with the Maven assembly plugin, you can deploy, you, you can put them uh, in, an, in your Nexus repository. And as soon as you have your API and your DTOs and your APIs updated, you will be able to uh, put this uh, specification to the Nexus repository. So where we are now, we have count two. We have two ways to interact with the uh, uh, back office with the Jipster stack. Uh, Let's say the blue lines indicates the JDL driven communication and it is yeah, mainly useful for your Angular front end or your React front end or even Vue.js. Uh, for external developers, you have uh, the possibility to generate client code now because you have exported the specification and you have also the possibility to give to devel developers just the APIs they need. For us, it's very important uh, to really uh, do in such a way that these guys can start developing as soon as possible, even in an asynchronous way. This is what we call code first. Uh, it has some limitations. As I said, API consumers have to wait. Uh, now, For now, only Swagger 2 is supported. Uh, Springfox, which is the library that scans the controllers, when you have a lot of entities, is quite slow. So it can even slow down the startup of your, of your application. And the security rules you find in your specifications um, basically what you configure into your security configuration, uh, have to be coded again if you want a really uh, exact API as uh, the security is configured in the, um, in the security, Spring security configuration. So you have to code to align the security rules in sp of Spring to the security rules of the specification. And API first JIPster can some, somehow help you before Talking about API first and the hipster, the benefits of having API first are mainly because you put design in the first place, you have interoperability, uh, you improve developer experience because uh, you decouple client server development. Uh, there, are, there is an approval process during API design. What we do actually for big projects is versioning our uh, JSON files, YAML files, and everybody can contribute if uh, front -end need, from a guy from the front end need uh, additional parameters on another API, you can just start code it, and then I will ask for approval via pull request or something. And also, uh, if you do API first, uh, you put API design, and you design your API with user experience and uh, user interface in mind. So API first, the hipster, I won't get into the details. I strongly suggest to go to the hipster conf 2018 and see Christoph's presentation and explains it very well. You just need to know that uh, API first Zipster, how many of you are familiar with this and are using this? Okay, not so many. Um, you're basically putting this definition file in your resources and it's an option you can enable when generating a Zipster project. And then thanks to Gradle and Maven plugin, uh, you get all the code generated and the only thing you have to do to implement these APIs is uh, implementing a delegate. So to implement all the APIs like this one you are seeing uh, in the backend, uh, you just have to add a service 
and implement your API. There are a couple of tricks we usually, uh, usually do when we are going API first, and it's something we do kind of with every project that connects with the outside world. The first one is to uh, add a suffix to the DTOs generated by OpenAPI, because so if some names overlap, you can distinguish uh, between the JIPster DTO and the OpenAPI DTO. And use tags allows you to group the endpoints uh, by tag and not by path prefix. So instead of having, uh, let's go back, instead of having only one laser, this one, wow. Instead of having uh, like one unique pets API here, Use tags allows you, allows you to, to take these write pets and read pets and generate uh, two separate delegates. It, this helps you when you have a lot of APIs to have the entry points of your application to be more faithful to what the API design is. Okay, so what changed now? Uh, we can decide that all the custom controllers we have talked before, uh, they are no more um, created manually, but they are generated. So we are in a situation where uh, the OpenAPI controllers are, generating from, are generated from OpenAPI plugin, and then they are again exposed, th thanks to Swagger, to the developers. So we have kind of three ways for interacting with the, our application now. And I need water. So uh, we have three layer, layers of communication. The first one is JDL driven, the second one is code first driven. And now, if you go and choose to go API first, uh, you basically allow, uh, you can see them from the green lines, to allow also the Angular front end to generate the code and uh, implement uh, some custom pages and custom uh, behavior that it's linked to your API definition. And also, you are kind of decoupling the development for Android and uh, React developers in this case. Uh, you also can notice you have uh, two main layers once you decide to go with OpenAPI. This layer, this low layer, this Open OpenAPI layer, tends to, to, to increase and have a lot of classes as long as you decide to go with, with this street. Uh, so you have to decide how to make this layer to interact with your crude endpoints. And with simple application, you can, you can decide to take your open API services and go to your service layer in the DTOs. But this is something you can do only with simple application. Uh, if you have big domain, uh, custom business logic, a uh, lot of native queries that are needed only uh, in this below layer, uh, I still strongly suggest you to go directly to the repository, okay? So you're still taking advantage of many JIPster features like the liquid base updates, uh, uh, the entity generation, uh, security, but when you go API first with big projects, you, s you tend to skip the first two parts and use them for uh, the customization and the back office. Um, in this situation, the JIPster front-end used the JDL APIs, let's call them, for uh, JIPster crude administration and customization. Uh, if you have both front-end developers and back-end developers developing on the same code base on a, uh, on a JIPster monolith, you have to, get to have a good uh, extension strategy to do it in such a way that maybe the back-end developer can uh, generate and update the entity and then front-end developer that don't get, doesn't get, uh, doesn't see the impact of this. And so you have to get a really good extension strategy. The API first endpoints can be useful for custom pages and pages that are, that are designed before starting generating the database and the entities. What about external application? Um, actually, uh, when, this is something we did, like with mobile application, we usually extract the authentication endpoints via code first, and then all the other logic goes API first. But still, if uh, you're flexible enough and you can somehow share in consistent way how your entities are shaped and share, and share them 
the specification, you can choose this hybrid strategy and go both, like let's say, API first and code first. But when your app when your app grows, uh, and especially if there are um, other developers involved from other companies uh, or even your uh, front-end team, which has five developers, and you decide to go API first, and you cannot mix the approaches, uh, then we recommend, depending of course on your strategy, to go API first. Um, okay. Mm, of course, this last approach have a lot of limitations if you think about the benefits of JHipster, because you might need to recode and uh, write and define the DTOs again. Basic CRUD operation, you might exploit, uh, you might need from the CRUD stack, uh, they have to be recorded in the specifications. So metamodel filtering and pagination, which are great features uh, already natively introduced in JHipster, if you, s if you decide to go entirely API first, you kind of lose them and you have to find another way to define them and being uh, and make everyone to understand how pagination meta model filtering works okay so we you lose really a lot of benefits of this part for what authentication is concerned uh, it happened to us that uh, the, the default authentication was it wasn't enough and we had to code it again uh, maybe some custom fields uh, or some sec different security rules or something different in the workflow that brings the user to the to your website for the first time. So we had to code it again and again you have duplicated code. So API first is a good option but it has limitations and it really depends on how much interaction you have with the external world. Okay. So now uh, I'm gonna show you uh, a demo. The first part will be about uh, customizing uh, some customization using, mod using a model we have written. Uh, the first thing that this model does is serving the API YAML statically, and so it's not generated by SpringFox. Uh, it replaces Swagger UI 2 with Swagger UI 3 in an iframe. And by the way, don't be lazy like me. I coded this module because we needed them, but there's an e open issue on GitHub there's a bounty on it, and uh, we need the kind we, we need help to integrate it natively uh, Swagger UI3 in the JHipster. So, if you can do this with a React uh, component or with Angular, help us. I will be help you to give you some suggestions on how to what are the problems in including Swagger UI3 uh, in JHipster. And another thing that this uh, module does is publish the API version in console or in JHipster registry. Uh, if you publish the version in console, you can, or in the JHipster registry, actually we did it only with console, you can filter out the endpoints by API version, and you connect the console with the Nginx, uh, HA proxy, or Fabio, which is another uh, smart load balancer, and basically routing uh, your uh, API calls based on what the API version contained in the API YAML file. The other demo, the other thing I'm, I want to show you is a preview of a module we are porting from uh, uh, this generator JHipster Swagger CLI. Uh, it allows you to uh, generate Spring clients starting from an open API specification. Now we have only server-side generation thanks to this module, always written by Christophe. <laughs> uh, we are kind of now we we are now porting this inside JHipster in such a way that you can now generate server-side clients, but also in the future, React and Angular code for interacting with the open API layer. Okay? Okay, so uh, here is the YAML specification I am including in a monolith I have already prepared. So you have already seen it. It's just uh, the different version of the pet store. Uh, and I'm included into a monolith. In the monolith, which is this one, you can presentation. Okay. 
As I said, I coded the dockets in such a way that authentication and API first endpoints, this is the API first. So I'm kind of isolating the APIs that are defined via API first in such a way that you find them grouped as they are defined in the specification. So the, the outcome of this is that you go, uh, here is the pet, no, it's just a simple entity, I already inserted some entries in it, and the API, you can see that I, I managed to group the endpoints uh, by prefix, and then you have the other endpoints here divided, okay? So now I'm going to run the module and see what change. So I write, yo, the hipster, API utils. Please go. <laughs> now the first question is under which path you want to serve the stat statically the API YAML file file. So I write API first. Okay. So yes, I want to add the version of the API to the service discovery tools. Yes, I want to use Fabio. I, I cannot explain it now. If you are curious about how Fabio works, just ask me later. So I just answer yes. And yes, I want to use Swagger UI 2, 3 instead of Swagger UI 2. So I just answer yes to all this stuff. And let's see what, let's see what changed. I'm going to do this open API. So the main point is this controller that thanks to this open API service goes inside your resources, parses the YAML file, and serves it statically to the Swagger UI. So the YAML file in this case is exactly the same as the one you define with your colleagues, developers, other uh, customer developers, okay? Then there is some customization uh, like console customizer that publish the API version to console, okay? So here I have already console running, and if I go in console, I can see that among other things, why there are two services here, tags, not here, not here. You get the API version, okay? And what I was t telling you before about uh, Fabio is that uh, he basically reads the tags of console and it interprets them as routing rules. So if you want to configure Fabio, you just start up it and then you publish the right tags in the console uh, store. So Fabio will be able to route the traffic to your application. Okay, this is something that can be very useful in development when you have different environments and stuff. Uh, okay, so let's see the, uh, the monolith. So, localhost. Now I go to administration and I see that I have included the Swagger UI 3. And, and you can use it, uh, and you can also see that there is authentication already uh, set. And uh, there's a lock here to say that write pets is protected, so you need the authentication to go in. And this is something you really can use and, uh, and something that your external developers are familiar with, okay? Among other things, uh, you, st you will still have the API first endpoint I showed you before, but you can see the difference. This is the uh, Spring, Fox, Spring Fox generated one, so it's not exactly the same. Uh, and then you have the authentication, sorry, and the default and the management endpoints. Okay, so what I want to do now is to go and build a, a client with the new submodule in such a way that I can connect my microservice to these, to these APIs, okay? So I already prepared a microservice, which is not here, but here. And what I do is writing jipster open API client. 
Okay, now I have three choices. The first one is uh, just give me uh, at the hipster endpoint, and I will pass the Swagger resources, and I will let you choose which API to implement. Then you, oh, otherwise, is you, if you have many micro, the hipster microservice together in your file system, you can point out, you can point to a directory, and this module will go uh, looking for the API YAML in the resources file. Otherwise, you can simply get go and paste a URL or a path of your file system. I choose the first option, and I write <laughs> the endpoint of my monolith. So now these are the same values you have in the Swagger endpoint. Because it's integrated with Swagger, it kind of extends, thanks to a bean, the Swagger behavior. And now I'm generating a client for the API YAML you have seen before. So the exact API YAML is versioned inside the, uh, the project. I decide to call it pet store. And I want to save for future reuse. OK, it's overriding something, not much. OK, and while I'll explain you what changed, I start the microservice. So if we go and look at the client, you go to, sorry. Okay. Now you have, this code is generated inside, scroll. OK, so you have these components, which are Fain clients, uh, are integrated with the Spring Cloud Fain, and you can auto-wire them into your, your code to call in downstream other APIs. You can also, let's look at one, very simple, you can override the URL by simply adding properties to your application YAML file. Uh, there's, this is the first API, this Right, and you can see it's very simple. Fain is very cool, has very cool features that map methods uh, to downstream calls. Okay, so what I want to do now is using this client uh, in a dummy controller I have written. So I just have to auto wire this and construct this controller, which is quite simple. Uh, I call the API list pets. So here I'm going downstream and calling the API endpoints. And then I'm iterating and to see and to return them to the controller. So now I go to the browser. I can type localhost 8081 pets. And if everything works, what happened is that if you look at here, you see that the microservice has called the monolith to get the list of pets. And then via Java maps to strings and return the list. OK? This feature is still has still the pull request open. Okay. This feature has still the pull request open. Uh, we are working on it. Uh, I'm trying to understand really how the JPSTER generation inside the main uh, generation work. And thanks to the team for helping me <laughs> and be so patient. Uh, so that's enough for the demo. The last thing I want to talk about is test containers and JPSTER. With our many applications we have developed, we, has, we have used uh, SQL Server, Postgres, MySQL, and especially in big projects where you use uh, uh, native queries, uh, custom SQL functions, uh, or you are getting mad at trying to write your liquid-based change logs, both for H2 and for your production database. So you, you write the profile, no, I'm in testing here, so I have to create this table. No, I am in production here. So. With big databases and many entities, we kind of uh, were starting getting mad. So uh, we, we discovered test containers, which is a library li Java li Who uses test containers here? Who's familiar with test containers? OK. Uh, it's a Java library that wraps, uh, uh, thanks to this library, you can spin up any Docker container, uh, any s service that can be put inside a Docker container. Uh, it's becoming very popular. And in the hipster is very useful if you want to run integration tests, not only on H2, but also uh, in a database which is the same of your production database. It's very useful for this uh, reason, and also because with a lot of liquid-based changelogs, if you test them in your integration tests, 
uh, you will discover before if you have problems and not when you are deploying the application for the first time. So this really helps. And the best thing is that to integrate test containers with Jipster, you have to change something like seven lines in your test configurations. You just add that dependencies, that dependency in case of uh, Postgres database. And then thanks to the magic of these two strings, the first one is uh, a special JDBC URL uh, with the TC prefix in it. And the other one is the test container driver. With just these two modifications, you will be able to run integration tests on your production database. So these are the three steps. Uh, I won't get credit for this. There is a very nice article written by a member of the JIPster core team. I will link it at the end of the presentation so you can go there and follow the whole tutorial uh, on how he did it. And he also explain how to integrate this with your continuous integration servers like GitLab using Docker in Docker. This is good. This is the easy way. Uh, but in our case, uh, we need to do integration tests with a private database that has already been customized with some schemas and some data in it, uh, and we couldn't really use Liquidbase for this. So we have done a module, uh, and to run it, you just have to, I will show you in a bit. Uh, this way, you are basically overriding how the data source is instantiated. Uh, and what you are doing here via Java API, as I told you before, you are pinging up the MySQL container in this case, and you start it, and then you pick up the information from it to uh, create your data source bin, okay? To use it, you install it, you run uh, Yoza Ipster test containers, and you can, in this case, choose if you want to run the tests in the, um, with the profile, so with test containers, or still with the H2, okay? So, um, recap. CrudeStack is the foundation of your app. If your app gets complicated, you can make it coexist with OpenAPI layer. Okay? Uh, go API first for mission critical APIs, otherwise take advantage of the generated CRUD endpoints of the hipster. Use test containers for integration tests, as you see, is very is useful, is very useful and easy to integrate. And share your models with the community. We can all take advantage of them. Okay, these are all the references. Uh, I will post it, the code in GitHub uh, today or tomorrow and we'll, it, the, it will be available at that link. And thank you. Java API, sorry. It asked me if the test containers, test containers is based on Docker. No, uh, it's a Java API that wraps and kind of helps you to, via Java API, to spin up uh, Docker containers from Docker files, Docker Compose files, uh, or if you are using a common database, uh, they have already the Java object prepared to spin it up and run it. But if you have a Docker file with, I don't know, uh, a custom web service exposed uh, on port uh, 8080, and if you have a Docker Composer or a Docker file for it, you can use test containers to spin it up and in the test phase. Okay. No, 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 no. Sorry, no. You you need Docker, uh, the Docker daemon below, and that's why for integration tests you need to, for example, in GitLab you have to. Uh, add the Docker feature so that the daemon can talk to the host machine and run and interact with the Docker daemon. So you need the Docker daemon, and if you are developing, you need the uh, Linux, or the Mac, or Windows Professional. Otherwise, I don't think it works with the Windows Home and the Docker Toolbox. Okay? <coughs> yes? Uh, no, I'm mainly talking uh, to um, JIPster entities uh, and to JIPster repositories. Uh, what you, um, but since uh, when you do CRUD, uh, you you probably don't need so many customized queries. Uh, you don't need you don't need of usually to go native and uh, do native queries and 
optimize queries for what you're getting. So you use the same repositories, unless you need another view or an entity that you don't need to be JPSTER managed. But mainly, we interact with JPSTER entities. So we still take advantage of the JPSTER stack. Does the structure API and top of the entity Yes, I would say so. It depends. Because in some cases, uh, if you model an entity, uh, thinking about how the database is structured, you model it in some way, and you can customize it using DTOs, and uh, you, you kind of you can customize it. But sometimes, uh, w when you think about how the API are designed for the front end, and how the database is designed, it's more convenient for you to have different at least this is my point of view, to have different DTOs so you have much more flexibility in customizing what's the UX, okay? Okay, thank you. <laughs>